Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you'd care to. We're getting ready to have an old-fashioned Bible study here at the chapel. We're going to pick it up today, 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 1. And in our last lesson, we left off with things continually getting worse and worse for Saul. Uh, his jealousy of David's successes uh, militarily uh, in the wars against the Philistines. Uh, of course, it all started with when David uh, killed the uh, Philistine champion of Gath, Goliath. But uh, Saul kind of kept his promise that he was going to give one of his daughters to whoever killed Goliath. And he did this, though, with an ulterior motive with David. And he's going to make it to where, uh, and they, they sent messengers to David, uh, and the king wants to give you his daughter. And he said, well, you know, what are, you, are you crazy? I'm a poor man. I, I can't come up with the kind of dowry that it would take to, to, to uh, have the king's daughter to wife. And they, said they took word back to Saul, and Saul was trying to set David up. And he said, I don't want a dowry for my daughter. I want the foreskins of 100 of the Philistines, thinking that in obtaining those 100 foreskins of the Philistines, David would surely get killed in his attempt. Well, David didn't bring 100 foreskins of the Philistines. He brought 200. And as we ended our last lecture in verse 30 of the previous chapter 18, it said that his name was much set by. And that word set by in the Hebrew means that it was precious. And that kind of sets the stage for the continual decline of Saul over the next several chapters. Uh, the jealousy becomes worse. Uh, the evil spirit that was upon him becomes worse. It finally drives Saul mad. So with that introduction, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. We pick it up, 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 1, and it reads, And Saul spake to Jonathan his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. Now, this would not set well with Jonathan. Jonathan and David were like blood brothers. They loved each other as they loved their own self. Uh, this, again, would, it, this is ever putting Jonathan between a rock and a hard place. Uh, Saul is certainly not uh, covering up his intentions any longer. He said, uh, I'm going to call my servants that they should kill David. Uh, there's no blanket over that intention at all. But you see, Saul's problem is he's fighting against God's plan. Anytime that you fight against God's plan, you are going to lose. And this is all Satan at work as well. At the end of our last lecture, I spoke a bit about the fact that the seed line through which Messiah would come was through King David. And if Satan had been successful in cutting David off, killing David before he had any children, that seed line to Messiah would be destroyed. And no Messiah, Satan wins. Messiah came and Satan loses. Verse 2. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. They were really tight. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul my father seeketh to kill thee. Now therefore I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning, and abide in a secret place, and hide thyself. Don't sleep in your own bed tonight, David. If you do, you will be slain tomorrow. 
verse 3, And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where thou art, and I will commune with my father of thee, and what I see that I will tell thee. Now, what he's going to do is feel his father Saul out and, and then let David know what Saul is, what his intentions are, although he made his intentions pretty clear there in verse 1. Now, David's not close enough that uh, Jonathan can speak with him, but what he's doing here is hiding from Saul, but close enough to where that conversation is taking place that Jonathan can get to David quickly following the conversation, and that accomplishes two things. He lets David know what Saul is, is intending to do and when, also, it would reduce the amount of suspicion that Saul would have towards his son Jonathan in that he's close by, he would not be unaccounted for but a very short period of time. Verse 4, And Jonathan spake good, excuse me, good of David unto Saul his father, and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he hath not sinned against thee, and because his works have been to thee word very good. David's been very useful to you uh, from the time that that evil spirit uh, came upon Saul and they sought uh, someone who was skillful in playing the harp. David was there for Saul. <clears throat> Saul appointed David to be his armor bearer. That's a very trusted position. Uh, then, of course, there was the matter of Goliath, when not any of the brave, courageous soldiers of the, uh, the armies of Israel would fight against Goliath. David, being a lad at the time, was willing to take his life into his own hands, risk his life and limb uh, to fight uh, for the God of the armies of Israel, who Goliath uh, had uh, defied. And then, of course, you had the successes that David is a captain of thousands against the military. You remember the, the ladies, the women of, of Israel would come out after the wars and say, Saul has killed his thousands of Philistines. David has killed his tens of thousands. So uh, we have a very much a voice of reason from Jonathan. He, he's trying to talk some sense into Saul. It just goes to show, though, you can't talk sense into someone who is irrational. Verse 5, For he did put his life in his hand. He, he risked his neck and slew the Philistine, in reference to Goliath. And the Lord brought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it, you witnessed it yourself, Saul, and didst rejoice. Well, he, Saul did rejoice until he heard the women of Israel singing, Saul has killed his thousands, David has killed his tens of thousands. Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? David has done nothing to deserve the way that you're treating him. And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan. And Saul swear, as the Lord liveth, he shall not be splain, and, uh, slain. Excuse me. Now, re remember, the Spirit of God is not with Saul at this point in time. He has an evil spirit. Now, do you think that do you think you could trust Saul? Anything that he said at this point? Probably a better way to put that question. Do you think David should trust Saul? Uh, in any way, shape, or form. You know, it's important to utilize uh, spiritual discernment. Uh, the more mature you become as a Christian, the more uh, astute your, your spiritual discernment is. Uh, you know, you should be able to be in a room and if, some, if an evil spirit comes in piggybacking on someone, you should immediately recognize it. You can, you can feel it in, in the air sometimes. And uh, that's what the importance of discernment. David certainly should not drop his guard 
against Saul at this point in time. You see, Saul has already tried to pin uh, David to the wall twice with a javelin. Verse 7, And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him, or told him, all those things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence, in his immediate presence, as in times past. This reconciliation will be for <clears throat> a very short period of time. Again, if you were David, would you trust Saul any further than you could throw him? I think not. Verse 8, And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter, and they fled from him. David did not have a cowardly bone in his body. He was quite a warrior in his time. And, you know, all of this fighting was necessary to deliver Israel from the oppression of the Philistines. That, that oppression was from the time of Samson. Samson, uh, a judge of Israel, uh, began delivering Israel from the oppression of the Philistines. Uh, Samuel uh, was a part of that as well on a religious front. Uh, then then uh, David completed the act of delivering uh, Israel from the Philistines. But it cost David. Uh, David very much wanted to build a house for God in Jerusalem once all the battles were over. God wouldn't have it. Why? Because David was a man of war, a man that had shed much blood. Verse 9. And the evil spirit from the Lord, the Lord allowed it, <clears throat> was upon Saul as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand. And David played with his hand. David, again, playing the harp, uh, trying to pacify the evil spirit uh, that was on Saul. And the jealousy, uh, these victories that David was uh, bringing to Israel over the Philistines, and the evil spirit were growing and growing, causing, again, it will eventually drive Saul mad. Verse 10, And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin. Here we go again. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Na David knew uh, Saul's intentions. You know, someone doesn't throw a javelin at you and then you wonder what their intentions are. David's getting tired of dodging javelins. A javelin is a spear, if you're not familiar. Now, this was the third attempt <clears throat> on Saul's part to kill David. In all, there will be nine attempts on David's life by uh, the, the remaining six will be by Saul's servants or his soldiers, if you will. But nine times uh, Saul or his men will try and kill David. I couldn't help but think about a cat has nine lives. Uh, maybe it doesn't really apply here because a cat's nine lives, I think, are uh, somewhat dependent on luck. David's uh, repeated escape uh, from Saul and his servants wasn't luck. It was God directly uh, protecting that seed line to Messiah. Verse 11, Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him, in other words, so he wouldn't escape, and to slay him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, that's Saul's daughter, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, Tomorrow thou shalt be slain. McCall is encouraging David to run. Uh, you know, that would not be David's style to run. Uh, I remember one time David did something that displeased the Lord. He, he decided and took it upon himself. Actually, Satan provoked him to number Israel. And God expressed his displeasure through a prophet. One of the three choices that David had of his punishment was to be pursued by his enemies for three months. Again, that would not be David's style running from the enemy. He ran towards Goliath, the champion of Gath, 
uh, running from anyone was not his cup of tea, verse 12. So Michal let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. Now this uh, David would spend a great deal of the next several years escaping uh, time and time again from Saul and his armies. Now, I, I like this way this verse is written here. It really illustrates uh, classic or typical Hebrew writings. The result is, is stated. David fled. Uh, Michal let David down through the window. He fled and he escaped. Now, it, in more detail, are we, is it going to be explained to us how these events come to pass? Again, this is classic uh, Hebrew writing, verse 13. And Michal took an image, this is teraphim in the Hebrew, and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster and covered it with the cloth. It was typical at this time for people to sleep with their face covered and a bolster, nothing more than a pillow. So what McCall is doing is making it look like David is still in bed sleeping. This teraphim, uh, probably a life-size human image of some household god, small g, uh, that and further illustrates uh, how far Saul had grown from Yahweh, 14. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. She's covering for her husband, David. And, you know, her, her, her father is a very powerful man. Uh, this could cost her her life if uh, her father found out that she was being disloyal to him, Saul, but loyal to David. Verse 15, And Saul sent the messengers again to see David saying, bring, up to, bring him up to me in the bed that I may slay him. I don't care if he is sick. You pick the bed up and physically bring the bed and David and all to me. I'm going to kill him anyway. It doesn't matter if he's sick. Verse 16, And when the messengers were come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. David would later write of this event and how uh, fearful he was, probably more so for Michal than himself, but the danger that he felt he expresses very well in Psalm 59. And Saul's servants are probably anxious for David to be out of the picture as well. Uh, you see, they are all interested in promotion and catching the eye of the king and here David is kicking Philistine and over and over and over, success after success. Why? Because God's Spirit is upon him. But uh, I think some of Saul's servants would be just as anxious for David to be gone as Saul. And Saul said unto Michal, Why hast thou deceived me so, and sent away mine enemy, referring to David, that he is escaped. And Michal answered Saul, he said unto me, let me go, why should I kill thee? Daddy, he threatened me. He said that if I didn't let him go, he was going to kill me. I'm sure Saul said, okay, that's all right, sugar. Um, I, I, I should have never distrusted you. Verse 18, so David fled and escaped and came to Samuel to Ramah, Ramah being the home of Samuel. Samuel's kind of backed out of the picture since Saul became king and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and dwelt in Naoth. Now at Naoth, there was a uh, school or a university for the priest and the prophets. Uh, I think Samuel probably started that school uh, you have contact with some prophets later years, uh, such as Elijah and Elisha. Uh, both were uh, involved with the school for the prophets. Now, I think David is probably seeking something from Samuel. You know, Samuel anointed David king over Israel, and now he's on the run for his life. 
for his very life. And I'm sure he's saying to Samuel, are you sure that, that God wanted me to be king of Israel? I mean, somebody hadn't let Saul know that because he's throwing javelins at me. Verse 19, and it was told Saul saying, behold, David is at Naoth in Ramah. I'm sure Saul thought, aha, now we've got him cornered. And Saul sent messengers to take David, to kill David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as appointed over them as the head of the school, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul and they all prophesied. This shows that God is in control. Here Saul, who is a powerful man, the king of Israel, sends his messengers to kill David. What does God do? He sends his spirit, the Holy Spirit, upon these that were sent to kill David, and they're totally changed. They're not interested now in killing David. They're prophesying right along with the prophets, the students at the school. And when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers. He sent another second group of, of people to kill David. And they prophesied likewise. And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied, prophesied also. Well, Saul has now sent three groups of people to kill David. Uh, what do you think Saul will do next? Then went he, in other words, Saul went himself, also to Ramah, and came to a great well that is in Siku. Now, Siku this is the only place in the King James Version Bible that this uh, place appears and nothing is known about it other than that there must have been a great well or a cistern there. And he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they be at Naoth in Ramah. Verse 23. And he went thither to Naoth in Ramah. And the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. A miraculous uh, deliverance from uh, not only Saul himself, but the three groups that Saul sent. All began to prophesy along with the prophets. Uh, God can change people's minds. He can change people. Verse 24. And he, referring to Saul, stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Wherefore they say is Saul also among the prophets? Question. Now, this word naked uh, does not indicate that it's not always used of complete nudity. Uh, it can mean that the upper garment, uh, such as his cloak, his coat, uh, it was, would, could be mean. Uh, and does, is that important? I think probably not. But uh, now this, is Saul also among the prophets? You might think back on chapter 10, uh, verse 11 of this same book. You remember when Samuel first told uh, Saul that he would be the first man king of Israel, he, he said a list of things that were going to come to pass. And one of those things was that he was going to run into a group of students of the prophets and that he himself would begin prophesying to indicate to the people of that community, his home, uh, Gibeah, where he was raised, that he was a changed man and something was different about him. And that's when they first said, is Saul also among the prophets? In other words, could this be? This is, this is amazing. This became a proverb among the people, is Saul also among the prophets? And again, what we can learn from that chapter is that God is in total control. Uh, I don't care how bad the situation gets uh, when the Antichrist is here. God's in control. Uh, he's going to be with his elect. He's not going to leave you hanging out 
to dry with the Antichrist. You're going to have exactly what you need, exactly when you need it to accomplish his will. He will make sure of it. Chapter 20, we're going to see Jonathan's uh, final attempt to reconcile uh, the problems between his father Saul and his blood brother David. Verse tw uh, chapter 20, verse 1, and it reads, And David fled from Naoth in Ramah, and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? Question. What is mine iniquity? And what is my sin before thy father, that he seeketh my life? What, what is my crime? What have I done that he's trying to continually pin me to the wall with his javelin? Verse 2, And he, this is Jonathan, said unto him, God forbid, thou shalt not die. Behold, my father will do nothing, either great or small. This means my father won't do the smallest thing without my knowing about it. But he will show it me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It, it is not so. And my father will tell me what his intentions are, and I will communicate those to you. He tells me, I tell you. Verse 3, And David swore moreover and said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eyes. Your father knows that, that you and I are close, that we're tight. And he saith, Let not Jonathan know this. Keep this secret from Jonathan, because if you tell him, he will go and tell David. And as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. Your father tried to pin me to the wall with a javelin three times, and I'm getting tired of dodging javelins. Then said Jonathan unto David, Whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. What, whatever you want me to do, David, you just say it, and, and, and it, consider it done. The next few verses are David's request to Jonathan. And David said unto Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon. Tomorrow is a Sabbath, in other words. And I should not fail to sit with the king, that's Saul, at meat, a feast day, in other words. But let me go that I may hide myself in the field unto the third day at even. Now, a lot of scholars wrestle with this verse as far as what feast day could we be talking about. Well, in my opinion, <clears throat> there was only one uh, new moon, or actually better said, the first of a month that was a feast. It was the Feast of Trumps. It occurred on the first day of the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar, which was called Tishri. Uh, then this verse goes on to say, David says, I'll hide myself unto the third day. Well, the, the Feast of Trumps was not a four-day feast. It was a one-day feast. I think that there was probably uh, Saul had a civil feast in conjunction with this, and that's <clears throat> the explanation of why we're talking about four days. Verse 6. If thy father at all miss me, David continues to Jonathan, then say, David earnestly asked leave of me that he might run to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all my family. You, you tell your father if he misses me that, you, that I asked you for permission to return to my family in Bethlehem to attend the feast. What David's doing here is setting up a fleece, uh, a fleece that he's is seeking knowledge or counsel from God. And he's going to set it up to where whatever Saul's reaction is to when he discovers that David is absent from this feast will be his signal whether uh, he can stay or whether he should leave. Now, the fact that David's family was sacrificing in Bethlehem at this time 
uh, Israelites were to make sacrifice at the tabernacle. But I'll remind you that at this time, the tabernacle is totally uh, in, is dysfunctional. It's in disarray. You got the Ark of the Covenant at kirjath Jerim. You got the uh, mosaic tent tabernacle, the tent at another location. There is no altar of burnt offering. So it was quite all right for families to set up their own uh, sacrifice. That was the only way to offer a sacrifice to the Lord if you chose to. Verse 7. If he, if Saul, say thus, It is well, thy servant shall have peace. But if he be very wroth, then be sure that evil is determined by him. Again, the fleece that David's throwing out, if Saul is at peace with David having gone to Bethlehem uh, to celebrate the feast with his family, then all is well for David. If not, if he becomes wroth, if he becomes angry, then be sure that evil is determined. Uh, in other words, Saul still wants David dead. Verse 8, Therefore thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant, for thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of the Lord, and there is none higher. With thee, notwithstanding, or but, if there be in me iniquity, slay me thyself, for why shouldest thou bring me to thy father? If, if you think that, Jonathan, that I have done anything that's deserving of death, I would prefer that you fall upon me yourself and slay me rather than taking me to Saul to kill me. Verse 9, And Jonathan said, Far be it from thee, I'm not going to kill you or turn you over to Saul to kill you. For if I knew certainly that evil were determined by my father to come upon thee, then would not I tell it thee. As soon as I knew of what my father's intentions were and when and how, I want to let you know. Uh, Saul's suspicious suspicions might lead him to believe that there was a conspiracy going on, and that's what David is fearful of here. He's saying, okay, Jonathan, you're saying that if you know about it, you're going to come and tell me. What if you don't know about it, though? Verse 10, Then said David to Jonathan, Who shall tell me, or what if thy father answer thee roughly? What if you don't know to come and tell me? then who is going to tell me? Uh, David, again, is very apprehensive, and rightly so. I mean, uh, how many times should someone try to pin you to the wall with a javelin that you don't watch them very, very carefully? You know, it's one thing to forgive, but when somebody throws a javelin at you, you better not be soon to forget. Well, how will all this turn out? It will. Will David be on the run, or will he be staying uh, to serve Saul? I think you know the answer already. David goes on the lamb in our next lecture. Don't miss it. We got a short message. Uh, won't you listen a moment, please? Genesis 1:46, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular CDs. How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you have always wondered about. Genesis 1:46. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S. and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that 800 number and leave your question. 
please don't ask questions about a specific individual denomination or organization by name. Uh, we try to teach God's Word in a positive manner. Throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing, fully capable of all three. If you're studying via the internet somewhere around the world and not able to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Got a prayer request? Well, you, we can do away with the telephone number. You don't need a telephone. You don't need a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24-7. You can go to Him anytime. I don't care where you're at. If you're driving down the road, you can talk to your Heavenly Father. You can approach Him. Uh, since Jesus paid the price on the cross, what is the first thing that He did when, when, when He expired on the cross? That veil was rent from top to bottom. That veil that separated uh, man from God. We can walk right on in now and I encourage you to do that. And there was an awesome price paid that, that allows you to do that. So talk to your Heavenly Father. I, I really don't think you have a lot of competition these days. Your brothers and sisters are so busy in the ways of the world, they don't have time for God. That's why you are so special to Him when you make time to talk with Him. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, Father. We ask you to look upon these. You know their needs, Father. We have illnesses, families, uh, that are sick, Father, uh, addictions to alcohol, drugs, you know, Father. If it is your will, a special blessing on these. We also lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. We ask you to watch over, guide, direct, touch, protect, and heal in Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks. First up, we have Don in Virginia. Was Joseph's wife, Asenath, of the children of Israel? Thanks for all that you and your staff do to feed us the Word, and you're, you're sure welcome. We're glad you enjoy partaking of his table, the Word. Um, Pharaoh gave Joseph, uh, Egyptian obviously being Pharaoh, uh, gave Asenath to wife to Joseph. And it states in, in the book of Genesis that she was the <coughs> daughter of Potipharia, a priest of On. Now, what you probably don't realize that is that at this time that Joseph was uh, working for Pharaoh, there were in lower uh, Egypt Adamic peoples who were called the shepherd kings. Uh, they're also called the Hyksos, um, the mother uh, of Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, you can bet that she was Adamic, not Egyptian. Guy in California, where does it have the genealogy of the other children of Mary and Joseph had after Christ? Well, of course, Joseph was not the father of Jesus. So let me clarify, Jesus was not the son of Mary and Joseph, Jesus was the son of Mary and our Heavenly Father, His only begotten Son. Now, uh, they, they, Joseph and Mary did go on to have other children. That's written in God's Word, Matthew chapter 13, uh, verse 55 and 56. You have his brothers named by name, James, uh, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. And then it states that he had sisters, plural, uh, however, not how many. But uh, nothing is said about genealogy other than that of their other children. James in Arkansas. <clears throat> when God asked Jeremiah what he saw, Jeremiah said a bunch of bones. Was that at the time or here in the future? And did he see spiritual people? Okay, we've got... Uh, who said that mixed up a bit. It wasn't Jeremiah, and I don't know if someone wrote your question down wrong or if you were confused, but obviously it was Ezekiel uh, that, that God asked him what he saw. This you'll find in Ezekiel chapter 37, uh, verse 1, and the following verses. 
and, and Ezekiel states there, the hand of the Lord uh, carried uh, Ezekiel out of the spirit and the bones were, of course, of the spiritually dead. And boy, we have a bunch of bones today, people who are spiritually uh, deader than a doornail. Uh, you can see them walking down every street in our country today. People just have totally uh, lost it. Uh, people have turned things upside down. They take what is right and make it wrong. They take what is wrong and say it's right. But uh, God asked Ezekiel, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel said, Lord, I don't, I don't know. You know. And the Lord said to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones. You see, that's how you bring the spiritually dead back to spiritual life. You prophesy. That's to teach the Word of God. The Word of God uh, brings spirituality back to the spiritually dead. Sandra in California, what does I for an I mean? Well, uh, and thank you for your kind comments after that. And bless you as well. Uh, you'll find that several places in God's Word. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 19, and the following verses states, If a man uh, cause a blemish to another, another person, in other words, so shall it be done to him. And then in verse 20 of Leviticus 24, uh, breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. And it simply means what you put out is what you're going to receive. Alma from Alabama. Uh, we know what our flesh bodies look like, but Pastor Dennis, what will our spiritual bodies look like when we go to be with our Father in heaven? Well, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, what did God say? God said, let us, referring to the angels that were there with him, make man in our image. So if they made man in our image and we know what we look like, we know what the angels look like. They look pretty much like we do today. And we have Jay, I believe, or Joy. Joy, I think it is, in Maryland. Uh, I love your show. Please tell me where did God come from? Who made him? Also, why does God let all these little kids in hospitals suffer from cancer? Well, God didn't need anyone to make him. Uh, he has been from the very beginning. Uh, he always will be. So, uh, in the book of Exodus, when uh, God appeared to Moses and said, Okay, Moses, you're going to lead Israel out of Egypt. And I want you to go and talk to Pharaoh and tell him, Let my people go. And Moses said, Well, now wait a minute. I'm going to go back down there and the people are going to ask me, Who sent you? And what did God say? God said, I am that I am. Ia asha ia in the Hebrew language will be what I want to be, when, and always will be. Uh, your follow-up question, why does God allow children to suffer? God doesn't cause cancer or suffering. Uh, he provides Christian doctors, nurses, and technicians that care for those who do become ill. But, you know, to be in the flesh, God didn't promise us that it would be a rose garden uh, he didn't say that man will never get sick or children will never get sick. He, he, he didn't promise that. And if you think he did in the Word, you're, you're not familiar with the Word. But he also did promise us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, that there's nothing going to happen to you that's not common to man. That means that there's nothing going to happen to you that hasn't happened to somebody else and that God will never allow you to be tempted above what you're able to handle without providing you a way out. I'll tell you, some of these little troopers in, in the hospitals that uh, are sick with cancer, and I'm talking about children, uh, they could probably teach us, a lot of us uh, adults, about faith and, and about belief in God and how to uh, take 
the negative of life uh, with a grain of salt and, and to make the best of the situation that you can. Clarence in California, first epistle of John 2.18, there will be many antichrist in the world. And then in Jude 1 verse 6, angels which left their own place of habitation and one in the world today. I'm not sure. Firstly, are we talking about the same people here? It would appear that Antichrist are born of women, but the angels that left their place of habitation and came into this world are not born of women. Okay, well, uh, the, those of Jude 1.6 who left their habitation, you're right, were not born of woman. Uh, they are the uh, Nephilim of Genesis chapter 6. They're called the sons of God there, the fallen angels though. Nephilim in the Hebrew, the prime, Napha, which means fall. And they refuse to be born of woman. And for that, they've already been judged uh, to death. And I'm not talking about death of the flesh. I'm talking about death of the soul. Now, when, when we were talking about the, even now there are many antichrists in the world, what it's talking about is there are many who, uh, not necessarily the antichrist, but those who claim to be Christians is what we were being warned about in, in those scriptures. Jeanette from Missouri. And thank you for your kind comments. Uh, there is a scripture that I've wondered about for decade, decades, and no one has ever been able to explain it. Matthew 24, 28, For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. And that eagles is, is a bad translation. It should have been translated the vultures. Wherever the carcasses are, that's where you'll find the vultures. Uh, Luke chapter 17, 37, uh, Luke's account of this same event, uh, I take this to mean where the bodies of the two witnesses are, Revelation 11, 8, you will find the vultures gathered to watch and see what happens next. You remember, the people are going to be celebrating <clears throat> when the two witnesses are killed and lying in the open area. And are they going to bury them? No, they're not going to bury them. You see, they put Jesus in a sepulcher, and when they came back, he was gone. A lot of people don't believe he was resurrected. So they're not going to bury the two witnesses because they're going to be resurrected as well. And boy, I say, I look forward to when that happens because you know what happens immediately after that? As they're ascending, Jesus Christ is descending back to us. The second advent begins. The Lord's day begins. Kathy in Texas, and you're welcome and, and question. Uh, you say God, in parentheses, Jesus died on the cross. Let's say Jesus died on the cross and took the stripes so that people and animals could be healed. Has God already healed us? We need to believe that he has the power to heal us and claim his promise of healing. Or do we pray for God's healing in each individual sickness? Thank you for making this clear. And the scripture you're talking to, Isaiah 30, 53, and I'll repeat, Isaiah 53, verse 5, uh, which states, with his stripes, prophecy of Christ on the cross, we are healed. Well, think spiritual, not so much physical. Uh, our sins are, are cured because he endured the cross. Uh, we are all in the flesh. The flesh, as I mentioned a moment ago when the question about uh, why does God allow children to suffer? Uh, sickness is part of being in the flesh. Uh, much of that sickness is brought upon us because we don't follow His health laws. We don't eat uh, according to Leviticus chapter 11. Uh, what do you do when you are sick? Well, James chapter 5, verse 14 tells us 
that to gather the elders and anoint. Well, well, what do we anoint with? We anoint with the oil of our people, uh, anointing oil, olive oil. Tony in Kentucky, I'm starting to go bald on the front of my head. Is there anything wrong with people shaving their head? There's nothing that I know of in God's word uh, concerning shaving uh, of the head. Now, uh, that brought to mind Leviticus chapter 19, verse 27, where it states that you shall not uh, round the corners of your head. Now, at that time, uh, there were uh, Canaanitish priests and there were some Arabic peoples who cut their hair from temple to temple. In other words, in a circle, it looked like they put a bowl over their head and cut off anything that came out below the bowl. But uh, God said, don't cut your hair like that because I don't want you looking like these heathen people. Michael from Texas, what does the word Bible mean? and then you give like a cipher basic instruction before leaving earth, I like that. Uh, have you ever heard this and what do you think? My brother told me this, all words mean something. The word uh, Bible is not in the King James Version Bible. And by the way, I like your, your cipher uh, basic instruction before leaving earth, but uh, the, the word Bible, if you just look it up in a, in a Webster's Dictionary, uh, you'll learn that the uh, Greek uh, plural of the word biblion in the Greek means book. And, and it is a book, it's the book, uh, the good book. Uh, also, Byblos is an ancient Phoenician city uh, from which papyrus came, which was the writing material that the scrolls were made out of, of the original manuscripts for the most part. Samara in Florida, and Samara is nine years old. I live in Florida. I have a question. What does it mean that 666 is marked so Satan can't get in our house? And I love your teaching. Well, I'm glad you love uh, studying the Word of God. Well, let's talk about the 666 first. And we learn in Revelation uh, chapter 13, verse 18, that the mark of the beast, that's the Antichrist, for those of you who know what it's talking about, that his number is 666. And he comes in the sixth seal, the sixth trump, and the sixth vial. And uh, you're talking about to keep Satan out of your house. What you do, what we do to keep Satan out of our house is we order him out uh, in, we don't ask him, we order him out in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, if you ask Satan to leave your house, what he's gonna do? He's gonna laugh at you. But if you order him out in the name of Jesus Christ, that you're exercising the power that Jesus gave you in Luke chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Power over all of our enemies, that includes Satan. Isabel in New York, why did the anger of the Lord burn against Israel and incite David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. This is amazing. We were talking about this in, in the lecture where uh, I mentioned that God gave David three choices because he did this. And uh, you're right, it does say God uh, was, the, well, let me continue. David then had to choose from the three things the prophet uh, Gad spoke of. Seven years of famine, flee for three years from the face of your enemies, or three days of pestilence. May God bless you and thank you for that. Now, make a note of 2 Samuel uh, chapter 24, verse 1, states that the Lord moved David, but in Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 21, 1, it states that Satan provoked David. I think it was the latter, and there's a second witness to that in James chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. And that is there, it states that God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. 
It's just not the nature of God to tempt people with evil. Satan will tempt. Maria in Oregon, I give my tithe and money, but people tell me that it's not necessary to give money. They tell me my tithe could also uh, be time to help other people, but I was taught that to give 10% in money. Well, tithes, the very word in the Old Testament, if you take it back to the original language, means 10%. That's what a tithe is. Uh, what is the purpose of a tithe? The purpose is to make sure, ensure, that God's Word continues to be taught. And therefore, you tithe 10% of your income where you are taught God's Word. Now, I think what you're thinking about or what the other person is telling you about doing good deeds for other people, I think that would be more considered an alm, A-L-M, uh, as Jesus taught in, in Matthew chapter 6. And an alm can be uh, something that is to benefit someone who is less fortunate than yourself. Bob in Louisiana, please explain Revelation uh, chapter 11, verse 7. Well, the beast is uh, the Antichrist. After the two witnesses have finished their testimony, the Antichrist makes war against them and kills them. And they lie in the street or the pata, the wide open area. And then verse 11, after three and a half days, the spirit of life from God enters them and they ascend. Again, I look forward to that time because what happens immediately after that, Jesus descends the Lord's day, the millennium begins. I'm out of time. I want you all to know that I love you a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's word in depth. When your father looks down from heaven and he sees you reading the letter he wrote to you, he makes, it makes his day, you make his day, he's going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important though, and it's this, you stay in your Father's Word every day. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645. 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.